Amen and amen. Have you ever experienced a moment in your life that it was a very personal moment of where that you experienced the grace of someone else? That you were guilty beyond any reasonable doubt, and yet in the midst of that, that they treated that moment as if that it was a moment that in the next moment it was just as if, just as if I had never done that. This morning, I'd like to share with you a passage of Scripture that uh, talks about our relationship with God and, and talks about uh, one of the tenets of, of the Christian faith is, is that God loves us enough, even in the midst of our sin, to cross that divide, that boundary, and to come to us where we are. And He was willing to do that. He's seeking a relationship with you and with me, and, and that's God's purpose. This morning from the epistle written to the Romans, from the fifth chapter. Would you stand with me? Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by His blood, will we be saved through Him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more surely, having been reconciled, will we be saved by His life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Thanks be to God for His Word. You may be seated. I have a good friend that is a pastor that um, has a son that came home one day and he said to his dad, Dad, I won two awards at school today. I won an award for having the worst haircut and for having the biggest feet. Now that would have been terrible in its own right. The little boy was in the fifth grade to have that kind of award bestowed. But what made this award terrible was his son had muscular dystrophy and on his legs were two braces that fastened around his waist and ran down his legs and so his shoes had to be a certain size to accommodate all that metal. Now do you think he was upset? He was so angry. He said, I didn't sleep a wink. And I'm surprised that when I went down to the school to talk to the principal that I just didn't jerk the door off the hinges going in. Now he was upset. And he goes in and he's the first one in the office to see the principal of the school and he tells the principal what has happened and surprisingly the guy is sitting there and just looking at him and taking in what he has to say and, and his last words, what are you going to do about this? I want justice. The person that has done this terrible thing, I want justice. To which the principal said to him, you have every right in the world to be upset. The teacher that did that shouldn't have done that. I mean, they should have, just decorum should have prevailed. But he said, let me tell you a story. And perhaps it will help put into perspective. Uh, and my friend was upset that the principal wasn't upset. Let me put into perspective you why I'm not that upset. He said, several years ago, I had three little boys in my office. And so two of those little boys were bullies. They kept picking on this little boy. He'd come to school and the little boy was sick, had leukemia. 
and said they kept bullying him. And one day, he said they were in the classroom and they knocked his hat off and they took his hat and they were throwing it back and forth. They wouldn't have it, have it back and were making fun of him. And he said, when they brought them in my office, I knew the little boy's story. I knew how sick he had been and said, I was so upset that I told, I put the little boy in the corner. I was going to let him see justice meted out. I was going to let him see what these little boys were getting ready to happen to them. And he said, I reached in my drawer and I put out, I took out my paddle. I didn't even call a teacher in to witness it. I was going to let him see that he was going to be taken care of. And he said, from the seat across the room, as he asked one of the boys to stand up, the little boy, the one who was sick, said to him, Mr. Mattis, please don't do that. Please don't do that. You see, they don't know that I'm sick. They don't know that I'm dying. They don't know that the medicine makes my hair fall out. They don't know that maybe next year I won't even be here, but please, don't whip them. Mr. Meadows was telling my friend this story, and he said to him, what do you think I did? I don't know. What did you do? He said, I called the little boy to come up, and I sat him on my knee, and I said, son, you are filled with more grace <laughs> than I will ever be. You're a bigger man than I think I could ever be. Over the next year, that little boy got sicker and sicker and finally was confined to a wheelchair. And at the end of the school year, that school bestowed on that little boy the highest honor that the school could give about merit and integrity. And all the things that go with that, and he had two students push that little boy up on the stage while the rest of the school came by and greeted him. And guess who the two boys pushing him were? The same two that had come in his office that day that he was getting ready to let justice blow down to them in a big, big way. I don't know if you've ever experienced that or even thought about that kind of thing of, of how the, to extend grace. But you see, when I hear that story, I think about that is how God bestows His grace on us. God has been trying to offer to us a relationship. And it doesn't matter how often that we have rejected Him, how often we have pushed Him to the side, how often we have said, no, I don't want that. God continues to love us and pursue us, offering relationships. It is an incredible thing that when we think about that God, the purpose of sending Jesus Christ into the world was to seek and save that which was lost. Now, I don't know about you. I don't, we hear these stories about heroes all the time who put themselves in the line of fire, who put themselves, their lives on the line to protect others and to save others' lives. But if we had time to think about those things, if we had actually time to consider that we were giving ourselves for someone else, would we really do that? I would hope that we might. I can't be assured that we would. But Jesus Christ came into the world knowing that his life would be ended upon a cross and that he was giving his life for a world that some of those folks didn't even care or would ever accept that relationship but he came anyway you see the bible is filled with these stories jonah was sent down to nineveh a, a city a city that was not a good city by all of accounts in the scripture that we read and he goes down and he preaches to them offering them the mercy of and the grace of god and that judgment can be averted if they will simply come back to god and and receive a relationship with him and much to Jonah's chagrin those folks came back they repented and Jonah was upset because he didn't think justice ought to be given out to them the scriptures tell us that when Jesus entered back into the city of, of Nazareth that city that he grew up in he went into the synagogue and there he asked that day for the scroll to read the scroll from the book of isaiah and here's what it said 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened upon him, and he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I am amazed. I am really amazed that human beings are so imprisoned by things that we know. We know imprison us. Our guilt, our failures, our shortcomings, all the things that we measure by God doesn't see those things. Young people, close your ears because I'm getting ready to say something here. When I was in school, elementary school and high school, I was a slacker. I don't, I, I've tried to think of a better word to use, but slacker is probably the best word I can use because I didn't study. I could make A's and B's by just listening. Back then I had a good memory. I don't have that memory now, but back then I had it. And all through school I, I was just kind of floating along. And then I ran into geometry. I don't know why they ever had created geometry. I know there's a reason for it. This building wouldn't be here without geometry, I'm pretty sure. But the fact is, is the geometry, that was the first time in my life I had ever failed. I, and the worst part of failure is, is not just the embarrassment of failing, but I had to take my report card home. Now, folks, my dad, I revered my dad. I love my dad, but my dad could be a hard man, especially when he realized that you weren't trying your best. And so I'm, you know, all the way home, I'm dreading laying that report card in front of him and letting him see that grade because, you see, he knows me. He knows I'm a slacker. <laughs> when you don't bring home your books from school, something is wrong. I laid that report card in front of him, and I, I'll never forget. He just looked at it and looked at me and looked at it and looked at me, and I'm ready for the justice to roll down like streams of water from on high. And he said, I'm going to let your mother take care of this. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> but then my mother was not one that liked a slacker either. But she knew, she knew something about me that she knew me well. Son, it doesn't matter that you failed. I want you to do your best. I want you to quit just floating through life. I want you to get involved. Now, I'm going to love you no matter what. If you fail, I'll love you, and if you succeed, I'll love you. But I want you to do the very best you can because, son, you've got, you've got the ability to do it. I heard that, Gary, I heard that a bunch of times, but this time I heard it. You understand what I'm saying? I'd heard it a bunch of times, but this time I heard it because this time there was grace that was being offered with it. I finished out geometry with a B. By the grace of God. I still hate it. I still can't do it well. I see a triangle and I run from the room screaming. <laughs> but that was the day that grace was extended to me in a mighty, mighty way. You know what? I don't know. There's some of you here today that, that may have never heard an invitation from Christ to, for him to be a part of your life. And, and I want you to hear that. Because the Bible says... You did not choose me, God says. You didn't choose me. I chose you. And I've loved you with an, a love that is uncommon. It is, it is beyond compare. It is beyond belief. You know, some folks say to us, faith is not a reasonable thing. And I would say to you that that's baloney. Because what is it within us that reaches out to, to that which we don't even know before we ever knew God? What is it that makes us want and desires to have a relationship with that which we cannot yet know until that has been preached and given to us by the Holy Spirit? 
Faith is a reasonable thing if you'll sit down and you think about it. But rather than just rejecting it and saying God is not real, then I would say to you this. I would say, test it. Don't listen to me. Don't let me try to convince you. Test it. Don't deny it. Embrace it. And if it's not real, then reject it. But I have got news for you that if you embrace it, you will find that it is as real as that chair you're sitting on, as the person sitting next to you, as that which you desire in your heart, God will fulfill in you. God comes to us in very powerful ways, through other people, through prayer, through worship, through singing, through study. But I find God in the most common things because those are the things that I see God at work in. It's not the extraordinary. It's really interesting in my life. I, I, I don't know why folks are always looking for God in the extraordinary things because God is in the ordinary, everyday things that are all around us. You know, and who can come to know this relationship? Is, does God have a criteria? Um, I don't know about you guys, but, but uh, when I was growing up, um, these blue jeans with the holes in them these days, people pay big money for those things. Did you know that? People pay big money for those holes to be in just the right place. And when I was growing up, there were holes in my jeans, but not because we bought them that way. They were there because over the course of time they wore out. And I know it's not this way now, young folks, but I went to school with a bunch of snobbish people. They were very snobbish. I mean, you couldn't be in, if you didn't dress a certain way or act a certain way or be a certain way, they didn't want you in their little group. But that don't, I know that's not the way it is now. But that's the way it was in my day. And that's what I grew up with. And somehow or another that translated to me even in my relationship to God. But let me, let me tell you what the Bible says about that. There is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ and God presented Him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in His blood. Now that sounds like high-sounding high words, doesn't it? Let me represent that in a story. Again, a true story. There was a class that in the course of three years had had seven teachers. It was so unruly that teachers just could not, they, nobody could handle them. And so they sent this young man there, fresh out of college, that was full of vim and vinegar, and he thought that he could do something, and he had a plan. And so he walks in, and, the, and immediately the schools are looking, the uh, kids in that class are looking at him thinking, won't be long for him. He's out of here. But the first day he stood up and he turned around to the board and he said to them, look, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to let you make five rules that we're going to live by. Does anybody, have, does anybody have anything that they want to put up here as a rule? And so be to class on time. He wrote that on the board. We can't lie. He put that on the board. We'll do our work. He put that on the board. And, and they finished out the five rules. And then he stepped over on that blackboard and he said, all right, now we've got the rules, but if you break them, what's going to be the punishment? And there's a boy in the room that he's a bully. He's the one that everybody sort of follows. He's the one that everybody sort of looks to. And he says, five licks across the back with the rod if anybody breaks any of them. Now, we don't know about that, but there's places that that, you know, happened. What other, what other punishment? No other punishment. That would be the only punishment. Five licks across the shirt on your back. Nothing in between for breaking any of the rules. And things, that class settled down and it, things were going well. Two weeks in, the bully of the class comes up and he yells out, Somebody stole my lunch. Teacher steps up, all right, who did that? They go around the room and there's nobody. And finally over in the corner is a little boy that 
pale, never says anything. Nobody was, had ever really hung around with him. He's over there in the corner, and the he, teacher said, did you steal his lunch? And the little boy said, yes. Why did you steal it? I was hungry. And so the class is in unison said, bring him forward. He stole it. Now he must receive the punishment. You see, that's in the Bible. We have the ten rules, and the, and the ju- God's, God is a holy God. Those rules are holy. And the judgment is, without that relationship with God, there will be judgment. But in the class that day, as that little boy walked forward, the teacher regretted the day that those rules had been written on the board because now the judgment was going to have to be meted out, and he was the one that was going to have to do it. The little boy came forward with a coat on his back, and the teacher said, son, take it off. You know the rules. You've got to take it off. No, I don't want to. Son, you've got to take it off. The rule is the rod will be laid across your back with just your shirt on. Please don't make me take off this coat. Teacher reached over and took it off, and when he did, the little boy was standing there with nothing on his back. Son, where's your shirt? I only have one, and Mama's washing it today. It's been a tough, tough time. My parents, Dad's been sick. Mom's been doing the best she can. But I had to borrow my brother's coat to come to school today. Well, son, I hate to do this, but lean over the desk. If not on your shirt, it'll be on your back. Teacher standing there with that rod in his hand, somebody's got to be the judge. But then the bully of the class said, wait a minute. Does the rule say anything about that somebody else can't take the punishment? No. Wait just a minute. The boy that had been so outspoken, the one who was certain about the punishment, comes forward and he leans over that little boy, presenting his own back. Twice. And the rod breaks. The teacher weeps. The boy weeps. Someone else was taking the punishment for something that had been done against them. This story speaks to me because that's exactly what God has done. That which was done against God, sin. You and I, the justice, the justice that should be ours, fell to his son, Jesus, who was sent To receive that which was intended for those who had broken the covenant, the law. You see, folks, I don't know if you've ever said yes, but God has sought you from the moment that you were ever a thought to now. Can you say yes? Will you say yes? And those of us who have thought that we said yes one time and we never had to say it again the fact is every day of our life we ought to be saying yes God I intend to continue following that you've done this incredible thing to me let me my answer today is yes I will follow you yes I will be your child you see that's the offer that is before us today God is offering you the opportunity to be his child will you pray with me